So today, as you can see, we're looking at the ocean as a system. Tomorrow, we'll be diving a little bit deeper into the blue economy. And then next week, we will look at adaptation and resilience. So first off, I'd love to thank all of the partners and organizations that uh, make these climate ba basics uh, sessions happen. So those are logos that you see on today's screen. That is the Technical University of Delft, where we are uh, broadcasting live. We have EIT Climate Kick and, of course, Irish Aid. So first off, I'd like to go over just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, this webinar will be recorded up until around the Q&A session. So if you don't want to be recorded, then uh, please turn off your camera. Please do keep your microphone muted throughout. So this helps avoid any disruptions during the webinar. If you do have questions or comments, then please just type them into the chat box and we will make time to look at them. And to help you get the best out of your viewing experience, then uh, close any non-essential computer or mobile programs. And uh, as we said before, um, we are going to be recording this session, so and we will be sh sharing with it. So please don't take photographs, videos, or screenshots. Um, we'll make sure to get all of this information out to you afterwards. And again, we love interaction and we love to know and hear what you think. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and we will have plenty of time afterwards to um, do Q&A. So first off, I'm going to introduce us. So who will you be hearing from today? So my name is Denise and I am your moderator for today. I am a project manager for Climate Launchpad, which is a global green startup competition. And Climate Launchpad is part of the entrepreneurship offerings of EIT Climate Kick. So next to me on the screen is David Watts. He will also be presenting. He is a strategic programs builder for Climate Kick, and he will be telling you in a little bit more about Climate Kick and climate innovation. And on the right-hand side, we have Maria Lelomi, and she is the presenter uh, for today, and she is the program lead for maritime and industrial symbiosis. And uh, today she will be the specialist taking you through the importance of uh, oceans as a system and tomorrow about blue economy and the importance of systems thinking. So now that you know all about us, we want to know about you. So we're going to do a little bit of a poll. So you can tell us a little bit about you. You know, we want to know where you're coming from, who you are, and uh, what your current understanding of uh, the subject is. So I'm going to start a poll. Uh, you will see it hopefully pop up in front of your screen or your com or your laptop, uh, your mobile. So we've got three questions. Uh, the first one is about uh, where you're from. So we want to hear about your geography, what you're doing, and you know which best describes you. So a little bit of a demographic. And lastly, and which one of the most interesting ones is, you know, who you are. You know, are you a startup? Are you a student? Are you a participant with Climate Launchpad or an enthusiast? We love those. So tell us, we're going to give you maybe a minute, minute and a half to fill this out. And then we're going to look at the results together. So for those of you that have just joined us, I see people joining in. You're right on time because you're in the poll. We have three questions. Hopefully, as you've joined, it's uh, showed up on your screen. We want to know who you are, where you're from, and uh, what you're doing. Okay. Let's see. We've got... Perfect. I think we've got everybody down. So... Let's look at the results. Where is everybody from today? We have plenty of people I see from Europe. So hello, welcome. We have the Middle East and North Africa, and we have somebody from Sub-Saharan Africa. So welcome, Europe and Africa. And uh, I guess that makes sense. So this is uh, everybody's uh, lunchtime, lunch break. So welcome. So thank you for spending uh, your afternoon with us. And which best describes you? We've got quite a good mix actually of uh, women and men, so nice to see a mixed crowd. And lastly, 
what kind of things is everybody doing? Uh, we've got working professionals, that's the majority. Lovely, we can see some entrepreneurs and startups. Hopefully you have participated in the program or are thinking about it. We have, uh, oh, great, a teacher, lecturer, professor. We have some enthusiasts. Oh, and we have some other. Now, I'd love to hear from you, whoever the other is, type it in the chat. You know, what best describes you? So, a little bit late, but here you go. You can see the survey results for yourself. Okay, and now we're getting into the nitty gritty. The next question is going to be about your understanding of the topic. So as of right now, what is your understanding of oceans as a system? Okay, I'm seeing a good mix here. Okay, maybe five more seconds for those of you that are a little bit lagging behind, no problem. Okay. So let's look at what we know as a group about um, the oceans as a system. We have some people that are totally new to the topic. I see we have quite a bit with an average knowledge and then we've got some with a good knowledge. So Maria, I think you're, uh, you've are you got a good group here of people to, talking to. So thank you so much for your yeah, for your answers and for participating with us, it's great. It's always good for us to know who we've got in the in uh, in the room. So now let us tell you a little bit about us. Ah, no. What we're, I'm gonna tell you about is what we're gonna do today, of course. <laughs> so we have the first topic and that is going to be an introduction on EIT, Climate Kick and Climate Launchpad. Afterwards, uh, we're gonna move the um, attention over to Maria who will be talking about um, oceans literacy and systems thinking. And then finally, we have an open Q&A. So this will take probably about an hour or so. So we have plenty of time for all of your questions and your thoughts and, um, and so on. So as I said before, if you, have, if you think of something, if you have a question, please do type it in the chat and we will get, um, we will get it answered. So now I'd love to pass the attention to David who will tell you about EIT and Climate Launchpad. Great, thanks for the introduction, Denise. Um, can we move to the next slide? Wonderful. So once again, thanks everyone for joining us today. We're really excited to have everyone here for our first ever webinar, um, specifically focused on the ocean as a system. Um, so before we get started, I just want to introduce um, us and who we are as an organization. So EIT Climate Kick was established by the European Institute of Innovation and Technology in 2010, um, which is a European Union agency. And we are Europe's largest climate focused public private partnership with a mission to innovate towards a net zero carbon resilient economy. Now, 10 years ago, Climate Kick started a program called the Climate Launchpad. Uh, which we've been running in collaboration with TU Delft for the last 10 years. Uh, and we're very proud to say that Climate Launchpad is now the world's largest green business ideas competition. And we're operating in over 50 countries worldwide. So Climate Launchpad, Launchpad's mission is to unlock the world's clean tech potential to address climate change. And we do that through supporting very early stage green startups around the world. 
Um, this is only made possible by a mix of great partners coming together, um, including EIT Climate Kick, uh, TU Delft, um, and then our sponsors, Irish Aid and Bank of America, who support the program. I do want to give a very special thanks to Irish Aid for sponsoring today's session in particular. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that the Climate Launchpad competition actually focuses on eight key themes uh, across different areas of climate innovation. And of course, today's webinar will be really focused on the theme of the blue economy. The blue economy has become one of the most, uh, let's say, hot topics within the climate space over the last few years. And it's a really important area of innovation um, when it comes to climate change. So without further ado, I'd like to pass over to my co colleague, Maria, who will uh, take us through the rest of the presentation. So Maria, over to you. Yes, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, uh, depends on where you are right now. Uh, I am Maria Loloni, yes, and we will discuss in the rest of the presentation the connection between these two uh, concepts that might seem unrelated, but they actually are. So one concept is the ocean literacy, and the second one is system thinking. So there's two different concepts that we're looking at. The ocean literacy is um, being literate about the ocean. So it's an understanding of the ocean's influence on us and our influence on the ocean. It's about understanding the basics, not deep understanding necessarily, but this is already enough for giving us some um, springboard for being able to innovate uh, in the ocean space. The second notion we will be exploring is systems thinking. System thinking is a, is a way of thinking. It's a school of thought. We use it for solving complex problems, problems like climate change or like uh, poverty at this point, the just transition everyone is talking about and perhaps linking this all together. And through looking at these two concepts, we will try to see how they are combined and looking at the, at the ocean as a wider system. So first of all, what is a system? So if you know what is a system, I saw quite a lot of you are quite knowledgeable. If you know what is a system or you, if you um, have a thought about what is a system, you can type quickly your answers in the chat so we can have a, an already an informal conversation, if we might say. Who would like to start? Uh, on the chat. David says, if it's a group of interconnected elements, the system. Mm -hmm. And don't be afraid to type. There is no right or wrong answer. A system is a system. It depends on our understanding, yes? And later we will see what system thinking calls a system. Connected components working together to achieve a functionality, Angelo says who's a participant in the Climate Launchpad. Hi, Angelo. Suzanne says a system is something connected with other elements. Yes, beautiful. Andoni says, ah, it's a private message you don't see perhaps uh, by mistake. Sorry, Andoni. So Andoni says it's a set of interrelated components influencing, influencing each other. Yes. So very similar notions, actually. Everybody's looking at the same picture, I think, from different angles. Um, yes, beautiful. And these angles are exactly, actually, it's part of the whole picture. So we're going to see now how Donella Meadows, a very well-known scholar in the systems thinking area, uh, what she has um, described to be a system. So Donella tells us that the system is a set of related components working together to achieve the objective of the system, whatever this objective is, because it changes every time. So related components working together to achieve the system objective. And let's start with an example. So on the left of the slide, you see a cell. This is a cell from the human body, which is uh, essentially its boundaries are the membrane outside the cell. So each system has a boundary. For the cell, it's its membrane. Within the membrane, 
uh, there are a lot of molecules, different ones, which are working together to achieve the function that this specific cell is made for. So if the cell is within the respiratory system, it will support our breathing. If this cell is part of the cardiovascular system, it supports um, the blood circulation. Yes, so this cell, it's alone a small system, but it's also part of larger systems like the cardiovascular system, the, the lungs, the brain, many other organs. These systems now, the organs which comprise of many different cells are part of an even larger system, which is our human body. The boundaries of our body is our skin and it comprises of many different elements working together, the organs, to achieve the objective of the system, to keep us alive and to do what we need to do. But the story does not finish here because humans are also part of larger systems. So we are part of our families, we are part of our community groups, we are part of our working environments, and each one of these larger systems has components working together to achieve its own objective. For example, our working environment, we are there together with our colleagues, we are the components, we are working together to achieve the objective, which is to keep the business alive. And all of us are also part of even larger systems, the towns or the cities we live in, which also have several components working together. Humans are one type of component. Then we have the buildings, we have the mobility system, we have a lot of other systems. We have nature in the cities, a lot of different systems working together within a specific setting. And here you see a summary of this, um, this interconnection between the systems, so nested systems. We have systems that are nested within each other. So we have the cells which are within the organs, within the body, we are part of our communities, part of our cities and towns and regions, part of our uh, nations and then part of the globe eventually. So um, certain principles about systems, why did we call all these elements systems? So on the right, you see three of the system principles. There's many more. So a system is a whole with many parts. Every system has components. These components of a system are interconnected. We don't see them as single entities. We see them with entities that have connections between them. And these connections are very, very important in systems thinking, more important than the elements. And third principle, systems display diversity. And now we go into the core of, the, um, of linking systems thinking with uh, oceans, ocean literacy. So we're, what we're going to do in the next minutes is we're going to look at these three principles that are attributed to systems. You see them on the left. And we will look how these connect to the basic principles of ocean literacy, which you see on the right. The ocean literacy principles are basics, uh, basic knowledge about the ocean. We look at them one by one, and we will see how these connect with the systems thinking principles. So first, uh, first system principle, it tells us that the system is a whole with many parts. You see this on the top of the screen. So on the top of the screen, you see the systems thinking principle and down below with numbers, you see the distinct ocean literacy principles. System thinking tells us that we have a whole with many parts. First principle of ocean literacy tells us that the earth has one big ocean with many features. So the ocean is one system. Uh, which covers 70% of the Earth's surface. Most of our globe is covered by ocean. It has many components. It has many sea basins, the North Pacific, the South Pacific, North and South Atlantic, Indian Ocean, Southern Arctic Oceans. And through these oceans runs an interconnected circulation system. This is a system which is powered by wind, by the tides, by the Earth's rotation, and by the water density differences 
and it creates a circulation system that regulates our climate, transfers, uh, transfers nutrients uh, and materials across the globe. Ocean literacy principle number two tells us that this ocean, this system makes the earth habitable. So essentially this principle is looking at the earth as a whole and part of it, an element, a component is the ocean. And this component is very important because it makes the whole earth habitable. Why, how? So most of the oxygen in the atmosphere originated in photosynthesis happening in the ocean. The first three billion years, um, the, 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 earth, the, the life originated in the marine environment underwater. So we essentially share the same um, origins, all of us, the same uh, relatives from back then, which came from underwater environments. But also today, until today, the ocean takes care of us because it provides us with water, with oxygen, with nutrients, and uh, supports climate moderation and life on Earth. We will see later also how. Second principle of systems thinking. It says that the components of a system are interconnected. So the number three principle of ocean literacy tells us that the ocean and life in the ocean shape the future of the earth. So there is an interconnection between life in the ocean and life on land here. First of all, the, um, we have uh, earth formations that originated in the ocean. A lot of earth formations were underwater, geological formations were underwater, and at some point, uh, because of changes in sea level rise and different um, geological processes, they came to the surface. So a lot of them, uh, the earth surface, the land surface that we see today originated in the ocean. And sea level changes over time have shaped the surface. So sea level changes because of different uh, time periods, different temperatures, different, um, we have the waves, which are also affecting uh, the land surface. And this has shaped how our uh, earth looks today. At the same time, the ocean is the largest carbon sink in our planet. So it stores 50% uh, of the carbon on Earth, and it's actually supporting with this carbon, it, the organisms in the ocean are supporting their own lives. So they're forming shells, they're forming skeletons, and uh, they're forming coral reefs. Principle number four, the ocean is a major influence on weather and climate. So there is an interconnection here between the ocean and the, um, and the climate of our planet. There is a, due to the oceanic temperatures and processes, uh, we have different, um, different patterns forming. So there is the, the heat in the oceans supports, uh, there's evaporation, the heat in the ocean also uh, creates certain circumstances, which is essentially creating patterns of rain and drought on the planet. And it also affects the strength of hurricanes and cyclones. And uh, the warmer the planet gets and the warmer the ocean gets because it is absorbing a lot of heat from the atmosphere, uh, the stronger these events become also. Uh, another point is that the ocean absorbs a lot of uh, carbon dioxide and methane from the atmosphere and a lot of solar radiation. So in this way, it's also influencing our climate because of the carbon absorption, and it's also influencing our uh, weather. And last but not least, principal oceans literacy principle number five tells us that the ocean and humans are inextricably connected, very important. So the ocean affects every aspect of human life, no matter if we live in coastal areas or on land. So it provides, first of all, and very importantly, fresh water. And this fresh water actually on Earth, uh, the water that exists on Earth, only 0 0.5 is potable water. And this is, uh, this is attributed to the cycles of the water also from the ocean. 
the water cycle. So the ocean evaporates and through certain processes, it provides fresh water to humans. It provides food, of course. We had a whole food chain um, which is existent in the marine environment and this food chain supporting us on land also. We have medicines which are originating in organisms in marine environments and every day we are finding more and more um, and more and more attributes of this organism that can support our medicinal science. Uh, we have minerals in the ocean also, and uh, we are all uh, we are using the ocean uh, as a provision of energy. So wave energy, tidal energy, offshore renewables coming in prominently uh, very recently. The the ocean also supports jobs and national economies. So there is a um, whole economy which is developed, which has developed around the ocean since ancient times. The biggest uh, cities and port cities were, of course, close to the ocean, and the biggest cities around these ports were close to the seas and oceans. Uh, it supports national economies, a lot of jobs related to the ocean, jobs from fisheries, from tourism, from offshore uh, renewables, as we said, from aquaculture, a lot of different. There's a spec of jobs related to uh, water and oceans. And the oceans, of course, serve transportation. 90% of our trade today, it's happening through the sea. So in the room where you are, it's either, um, it's either an item like your computer itself, which has been transported through the ocean at some point or the components of it. But also apart from the economic activity, uh, the ocean is also a source of inspiration. So a source of inspiration, of recreation, and of cultural heritage of many, many nations. So it's not only about economics, but it's also some other values that are um, linked to our well-being and to the oceans. How we affect the oceans now, a very big chapter also. So the activities of humans are affecting the ocean in many different ways. Uh, pollution is one of them. So pollution of the waters, we have plastic pollution um, and also acidification of the ocean. So the more carbon that we put in the atmosphere as humans that we produce, the more it's absorbed by the ocean and the more the ocean is acidified, which means that it's chemical composition. It's changing, it's becoming more acidic, the pH changes, and this is affecting the survival of marine organisms. And uh, we are trying through laws and regulations to manage these resources, to manage what uh, we are harvesting from the ocean and how we are interacting with the ocean at many different fronts. And we have laws and regulations and activities from the local uh, level up to the global level since the ocean is uh, across um, all different levels, of course. And the last systems principle is the principle that systems display diversity. In the ocean context now, we see the ocean um, supporting a large diversity of life in it. Of course, the ocean is vast. Uh, it's not populated in the same way by marine organisms in all parts of the ocean. Some parts are busier, some parts are not. It depends on the nutrients in the sea. It depends on the circumstances, on the light that comes through. It depends on the um, pollution also. Uh, but in any case, the life uh, ranges. So in the ocean, we can find from the smallest things like the microbes, which are essentially the basis of our food chain to the largest animal that has ever lived on earth. And that's the blue whale about 30 meters length, if I'm not mistaken. So you can imagine how large uh, animals we're talking about here. The diversity is very big in the ocean than on land. And we have, and they support also, oh, this whole diversity supports life. So for example, the microbes are producing a lot of oxygen um, in our, on our planet. There is so many species in the ocean, but we don't know about them yet. So this great diversity, we see on principle number seven, that it's largely unexplored. 
So less than 20% of the ocean has been explored already, but we are advancing. So there is new technologies, we have sensors, we have tools, and we are slowly expanding our understanding of the ocean. And we need to further advance our um, R&D spend to be able to understand more and be able to, um, to manage better what we do, our own activities also. Apart from the diversity in the ocean though, we have, we need a diversity in the human species, in our teams in order to explore the ocean. So we need teams that are, um, that are including different professions. So great collaboration between professions like biologists, chemists, climatologists, computer programming, even animators, illustrators, to be able to convey and transfer these messages and, um, and the data, the scientific data that we are slowly um, bringing to the surface. And here is a recap of, the, of what we just um, discussed. So I am bringing this slide back. So we are talking in the systems principles, we're looking at a system which is a whole with many parts, with components. These components need to be interconnected and display diversity. In the ocean literacy, we just shared some basics about the ocean, how the ocean, uh, how the ocean shapes our futures on land, how it influences our weather and climate, how we are dependent on it for our lives, connected with it as humans, and uh, how what we do on land and at sea every day in our everyday lives matters for the health of the ocean. And thank you for listening so far. And uh, I pass it to Denise for a small poll at this point. Thank you so much, Maria, for your uh, for your really interesting uh, presentation and um, yeah, quite um, yeah, quite a deep um, exploration of the oceans as a system. And for everybody joining us, welcome back on shore. So first, I'd love to do a poll uh, to see uh, what you thought about um, Maria's presentation and what you've learned. And then we're going to move on to a Q&A where you will be able to ask uh, all of the questions, any questions that you have for Maria. So first off, I'm going to put the poll up and this will be about your end of session. And so there's two questions. I'd love to know, uh, what is your new understanding of the oceans as a system? And I'm curious to see if um, whether the answers have changed since we started um, the session. And then of course, really important is, um, did you enjoy this session? Great, I'm seeing lots of answers coming in. So that's really good to see. And for those of you who haven't done our poll before, then you should have seen a pop-up uh, come up on your screen. If not, no worries, let us know in the chat. Love to hear what you think either way. Okay. So I'm closing the poll now. We've got some really nice answers. So in terms of uh, the new understanding of oceans as a system, I'm really proud and happy to see that the curve has moved a little bit um, uh, further down. So we've got people that have a little bit of a better knowledge. And now we've seen loads of people having good and up to excellent knowledge of um, this topic. So. Thank you so much for all of your attention and uh, well done to Maria for explaining it in such a uh, understandable way. And next, it's also really happy for us to see that um, most of you um, enjoyed the session a lot very much and some of you neutral. So it's really nice to see the curve also 
on the uh, on the enjoyable side of the uh, of the of the line. So finally, I'd love to share with you um, before we go into the Q and A is uh, we have a um, a survey that you can fill out either now or or later. So we're going to type that into the chat. And so while you start thinking about the questions that you have, then uh, please do type them your questions into the chat so I'll present them to Maria. So as Suzanne gives me a hand, uh, putting the link to the survey into the chat, I'm loving it. I'm seeing loads of questions come in. So Maria, I hope you're ready. So I see a question um, to see. Maria, a, a big question for you is how do you see the future of the ocean? You know, what could be some benefits from seeing the, the ocean as a system going forward? Uh, yes, I will stop sharing the screen for a second so I can see more of us. Yes, so uh, because it feels like I am uh, talking into a hole. <laughs> now I see, welcome, yes, again, everybody. Now I see all the names and I see you all on screen. So uh, give me again the question, Denise, please. Can you so repeat? How do you see the future of the ocean and what could be a benefit of seeing the ocean as a system? Mm -hmm. So the future of the ocean. So this is discussed on many different levels right now. Actually, what future do we want for the ocean is the question. And um, and behind this question is what future do we want for the oceans so that we can also have a healthy life because the oceans are affecting uh, human life so much. So it's very, very important our decision now on the state that we want to keep them in uh, in order to um, to mostly benefit as a human species. And also, there is also an ethical component here that apart from us, there is also so many other species and there is also other merits of the ocean or any other uh, structure that is uh, out there, yes, on our planet. So um, what is the future? So the future as it seems right now it seems a bit bleak uh, the picture right now because there is uh, quite a lot of pollution so we're looking at the five plastic gyres across the globe we have um, also chemicals pollution we have uh, biodiversity loss but uh, right now as it seems there is a um, big movement so this decade it's also called the UN decades of the ocean and there is a movement of um, us educating ourselves into the, in the ocean um, piece and understanding the ocean better so we can better decide when we need to. And there's also a movement also of policies coming through that are supporting. So we're talking about marine protected zones. We are talking about uh, reducing emissions from shipping, from the shipping sector and other sectors. We're looking at new models of providing what we need as humans so we reduce uh, also the impact fisheries have on the oceans. So there is a there is a, 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 a um, there is a quite disappointing picture at the time showing, but at the same time there's a, there's a very optimistic movement that actually will take us to a healthier future, hopefully. And this is what you are also all of us are here for today: climate launchpad and uh, innovating for a better uh, blue economy future, a better a cleaner ocean future. The importance, I forgot the importance of thinking as a, in systems, yes. So that's important when we're innovating. So considering the ocean a system when we're innovating and all these interconnections, it's very important because it changes the challenge we're facing. It gives us a different lens, yeah? So instead of the what is the problem locally where I am, it brings the lens to how does the context, the wider context, affect the issue I care about. 
And that's where the innovation might not come to solve the problem itself right here in front of us, but it might come and it might become an innovation that tackles another part of the picture. Uh, let me give an example, uh, plastic pollution. So plastic pollution in the seas. It could be that there are innovations that are actually we need to tackle and uh, pollution as it is. So for example, you see um, innovations for collecting the plastic from the sea. But at the same time, there is a bigger picture of how does this plastic end in the sea? So that's where innovation is trying to tackle less use of plastics in the first place, less production and use, um, capture of plastics in the rivers before they end up uh, coming into the ocean. And this is a more systemic approach uh, appearing there. Thank you, Maria. That's a really great answer because you've touched actually upon uh, the next question that we see in the chat is um, examples of how systems thinking is being used. So I think, thank you so much for ex that example. And maybe going back to what your the first part of your um, of your answer regarding the ocean as it is, then we have questions about um, how do oil and gas contribute to uh, pollution and as a uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, what is uh, what is your what are your thoughts on that? Yes, so I wouldn't know the figures necessarily by heart, but I think it's uh, the, the picture it's uh, roughly what we what we have all seen essentially. So exploration in the sea, offshore exploration, it's already difficult because there is a whole new installation and very different processes that are used for the exploration on sea rather than on land. Platforms need to be built. There is an offshore element. There are cables going underwater. So there is a lot of impact already in the marine environment there. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we see the trend that most of the um, accessible sources have, there's still exploration going on, yes, but most of the accessible uh, resources have already been, are already been exploited. So we start now seeing a movement to offshore energy, <clears throat> offshore wind, offshore solar. We are seeing wind and tidal energy coming much more prominently into the picture to uh, change this landscape, the existing one, which also includes, of course, in the picture, the oil spills. We remember a few incidents ourselves in our lifetimes. So, yes, we are moving into more into renewable energy sources uh, right now, slowly uh, but surely, and because of all the, of course, about the whole legislation piece and the global move towards sustainability. Great, thank you very much. And I see a question coming up. Uh, so what is the stage of the high sea production and, you know, in terms of state of development and what could be the main uh, the main issues related to that? Uh, so I know understandably I'm asking questions out of order, but don't worry, we will get to all of your questions. So, um, but for Maria, uh, what is the stage of high sea production? Uh, so I'm not sure what it means, the stage of high sea production, but for the high seas, it, it, there, is a, there is a specific trend which is uh, observed overall. So there is, a, um, there is a decline in fisheries. There are situations where we have a uh, large biodiversity loss and some species are already extinct, of course. And this is something that the United Nations is really looking at closely right now into the high seas also because it's international waters. And we're looking at the... Um, Canning Montreal Protocol, which was uh, the biodiversity framework, which is essentially um, trying to, the countries will try to preserve 30% of land and sea by 2030. And this is a very big signal that we need to protect areas and allow them to breathe essentially from, um, from human activities so that we high, uh, so that we have again, the highest seas flourishing in relation to uh, biodiversity and also the the apart from the high seas, also the the the, the seas that are much closer to our continents. Yes, the problem is actually everywhere. Great. So I'd love to move from the problem now. Let's talk a little bit about some solutions. We have uh, questions about what your thoughts on, uh, for example, aquaponics and conserving the ocean system, and also uh, seaweed. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Aquaponics. So there is a lot of um, there is a lot of work uh, done right now on uh, cultivating seaweeds and aquaculture aquaponics. To um, first of all to store carbon 
to, to revitalize the oceans and the seas, but also as methods to store carbon and to support biodiversity. So the, 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 the picture looks like uh, right now there is a um, shift from production for food and feed that humans need and also materials that can um, that can be produced in the sea instead of land. So like this, we're saving land space and uh, quite some um, materials uh, that uh, need to be used in that case. So yes, seaweed is very important. Different types are explored. Also algae, very, very important. Microalgae, macroalgae of different sorts, uh, both for uh, human, uh, human use, but also for uh, feed for animals and for biomaterials and biofuels. Um, yes, are different parts of the globe. And much easier to maintain quite uh, in quite a lot of cases than um, we would have and much less surface taken up uh, than other ways of producing the same materials. Great, thank you, Maria. And um, could you clarify on the relationship between oceans and uh, inland water bodies? Yes. So. Inland water, inland water, potable water is 0.5% of the total water on our planet. Another two and a half, about two and a half is uh, stored uh, in glaciers. And then the rest of the 97% is in the ocean. So the whole water cycle is, um, is coming actually from the ocean and from evaporation. So these water bodies, the water is moving between all these bodies uh, in different forms. The um, relationship I mentioned before, the plastic I think I mentioned, which is essentially, uh, I think it's 10, 10 largest rivers of the earth are transporting uh, plastic into the ocean. So looking at the ocean, we have the plastic pollution, but where does this come from? And that's where it starts from the river. So there is a lot of effort right now and innovation happening to capture pollution, in this case, plastic, already in the rivers before reaching the sea, instead of capturing it after it reaches the seashores. And there's a question about wildlife. So let's talk about wildlife biodiversity. Do you um, have insight into the um, whether uh, the wildlife matter, um, in the ocean is um, going extinct um, at the same rate as that on land? Uh, or no, being affected uh, as? Yes, yes. I know it's affected in, in a very similar way. So it's from human activities and from activities that are not necessarily based on conservation or sustainability. Uh, but it's more the exploitation model. The rate, I'm not sure exactly uh, how it is. And actually, because we haven't um, analyzed our ocean so much, I'm not sure if this information is uh, uh, available in very specific terms. But it's a very similar trend. It's this over-exploitation. It's, um, sometimes it's unregulated. There is a lot of, also, some quite some regulation, for example, for fisheries. But it's difficult to control. Um, the regulated uh, parts of the sea, obviously, but technology is now helping us through satellites and other means. Um, so yes, we hope that it can recover, but still the, the issue is very challenging and it's uh, essentially uh, very close to, it's the same problem, this biodiversity loss, it's happening on sea and on land at the same time. Great, thank you. So um, it is um, then, uh... We have then a follow-up question is, uh, what is the importance of focusing on um, inland water, for example, rivers and lakes, the, the quality of that water versus the quality of the water in the ocean? Uh, so the quality, so the quality, they have different functions, yes. So the, the water, the inland water has also, there is a significant amount of pollution, but now the latest data shows that there is also a revival. So in certain parts of the globe, we have rivers where fish starts reappearing that was extinct almost for years. The quality is better because chemicals, there is a larger ban on chemicals being dumped as it used to be done in the previous decades in the rivers and water bodies. So the quality is slowly getting better. And also the, the water quality in the oceans, we have different types of pollution normally. So there is one body which is coming from the inland waters. Yes, of course, when the uh, river reaches the ocean, but also there are um, sources of pollution in the ocean. For example, 
from the shipping industry it could be. Or we have also elements in the ocean like um, uh, the transfer of different species. It's not pollution, but it's a different uh, type of um, of changing of the environment, let's say. Um, both are important. I wouldn't say that one is more important than the other. The rivers have different functions for humans as well. So they're much closer to us, much closer to our settlements. Uh, we use them for drinking the rivers and the lakes. So the, there might be quite some more attention there because we also need it for direct survival, for potable water. But um, one more important than the other, I, I wouldn't say so. I think they're because they're also interconnected in a very big, uh, very strongly. Uh, both are important, yes. Thank you. And uh, so I think we're nearing to our last uh, question. I Oh, I see a really interesting point from Andini. So I say um, it's a really good point that you've made about taking care of the rivers this summer at saint jean pied de port which is quite away from the coast. Um, they saw signs seeing that the sea starts here. So it's really great to see that um, people and communities are taking up on that idea. This is a very beautiful point because it's very difficult sometimes when uh, we live on land to realize our connection to the sea, how much of a direct connection we have to the sea. So this sign actually, I find it very, very beautiful that they're already telling us at some point, which is much more inland, that actually what we do here, it's important uh, for the quality of the sea. It's not far away, it's actually here and here we need to act. Really great, really, really great. So uh, one last one is, uh, could you tell us then a little bit more about species moving or migrating due to changes uh, in the ocean and how does this impact uh, humans and biodiversity? So there is a, yes, there is a larger um, trend which is happening. There is a migration of different species in the sea because of uh, climate change. Uh, but also it happens because of the because of the ships quite often, because of the trade. There is many reasons that this can happen. So there are species that live in other parts of the globe than they should, or direct migration because of climate change. I think we had um, in the south of Europe, there is a lionfish, which came through the Suez Canal and is now living in the Mediterranean. It didn't used to be here before in the Mediterranean. So we see quite a few changes and this is impacting in the same sense, all these uh, species that are finding themselves in different environments than they were originally, uh, let's say planned for. Uh, of course, they affect local biodiversity because they're not part of the local food chain or the local environment. So normally uh, the influence, it changes a lot. We hear a lot about bad influence because the food chains are interrupted. Uh, sometimes it could be less um, less uh, harsh. And I can also respond, I just see the, the last question here before we close. Uh, yes, to, to end with on a positive note, <laughs> how can ocean help us combat climate change? So yes, right now the ocean is warming. Actually in 2023, we had the warmest uh, ocean temperature ever recorded. And this warming of the ocean, warming of the water, reduces its capacity to hold carbon dioxide. So this is, uh, that was not the positive note. <laughs> the positive note is actually <laughs> that we are all of us here and we're all trying to support the ocean and its processes with our innovation and with thinking differently so that we can get to the level where the ocean supports us like before, yes? So the ocean is there, it's already supporting us, it's doing a lot, it's absorbing much more carbon than before, but now because it's warming, it will, the situation changes uh, slowly, but it's up to us actually to make it, uh, make it uh, happen that the ocean supports us as much as it can. We support the ocean ourselves as much as we can, not only extracting, but also being there with the ocean as one system, as the earth system. We are part of it too. Great, thank you so much for that uh, last note. And I love it that we ended on a positive note. And I think that's a really good, uh, yeah, lead in into our next um, 
session, which will be tomorrow. Um, so as you, as I mentioned earlier, then this is, um, we have three climate basic learning sessions that um, are available. Um, so today we did oceans as a system. And tomorrow we have introduction to the sustainable blue economy. So tomorrow at the same time, and Maria then will touch up more upon uh, what kind, um, yeah, what are the challenges related to the blue economy? And importantly, on the positive note, what are the opportunities um, that presents us with this blue economy? And then next week on September the 12th, we have um, Adaptation and Resilience 101. So on that note, um, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in. I hope you found it uh, interesting and inspiring.